Hello everyone and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Venetia, this is the Woolly Worker Knitting Podcast and today I am joining you for episode 14. If you're new to my channel, then welcome. Like I said, I'm Venetia. I'm originally from Belgium, but I live currently in Scotland with my partner and I moved here to study psychology and I haven't looked back since. I've been knitting seriously for pretty much uh, over a year in July. It was my sort of knitting anniversary. And I started this channel six months ago because I just needed a place to rave about knitting and talk about all the details of my projects and document that journey. So thank you so much for joining me on this journey. If you're a returning viewer, then thank you. It means the world to me that you've been here with me for as long as you have. It's really nice to see familiar names and faces pop up and I love to chat with you guys. So you can find me on Ravelry and on Instagram at The Woolly Worker. I also now have a Ravelry group. The link is down below. You can find it on my Ravelry profile, but like I said, I'll put a link below if you want to join there and share your projects, chat with people and be notified whenever there's a next giveaway or knit night or cal etc. I also want to mention that in all of my videos I keep a very detailed description box where you can find all the details of yarns, patterns and designers pretty much and stores I mentioned, people I mentioned, everything that I think you'll have an interest in I put the link below so it's easily accessible for you and I also put my measurements now uh, as a new kind of idea just in case uh, you wanted to check out the amount of ease that like the sweaters have on me I thought that could be useful for you guys and yeah, I also started a coffee. I feel a bit weird talking about that, but basically uh, if you wanted to support the channel in a monetary way, you could just donate uh, for just the price of a cup of coffee, a couple pounds, and all of the proceeds would be put towards the YouTube channel, for example, uh, getting the microphone and paying for postage for the giveaways or the yarn and also for a Zoom membership cost because that would help me organize more knit nights. So, and it's absolutely no obligation whatsoever. If you just wanted to uh, donate, then that's the link where you could do it. So I also put the link of that below, but I won't mention that in every video because um, it is just... It's just, it's just there if you, if you want it, but no obligation whatsoever. So uh, this episode will be quite good. There is, I mean, I hope so. There's one finished object that I'm wearing now that is a sweater, so one sweater finished object. But then there's also five brand new finished objects that I didn't even talk about pretty much in previous episodes and they're all stash busting accessories so I'm really really happy to be bringing that to you as like a way of hopefully inspiring you and motivating you to use up your stash and your scraps and there's uh, gloves, headwear, pretty much yeah that's it so hopefully something for everyone and yeah that's really exciting and then there's a couple of works in progress kind of like long term ongoing projects that I have some progress on and wanted to, to talk to you about and then a couple new cast ons I think that are still works in progress. So if all of that seems interesting to you or any of that then let's keep on watching and uh, I hope that you will knit along and relax while watching this episode. I don't know how long it'll be because there are a lot of projects but I don't know if I'll have that much to talk about. Okay so the first thing that I will talk about then is what I'm wearing and it's my finished object. This is the Joan sweater by Gregoria Fibers. I've been talking about that for a couple episodes now and it's the yarn that I've used is BC Garn Loch Lomond in the color Sand 19 and this project is a bit of a roller coaster because uh, if you saw my previous episodes you'll know that I was feeling mixed lukewarm feelings about it. Uh, both the yarn and the project the pattern the yarn the only thing I don't like about it is, is the color I just I think it's a fine color and it, it looks okay it's just not my color and it doesn't like do anything for me like it doesn't bring me joy when I look at it but I don't hate it either it's just I wish I had picked a different color and I still feel that way even though when I have like makeup on and I'm wearing like ni nice black jeans I feel good about it but if I'm wearing my gray joggers I feel it doesn't look good and it's like washed out and too pale uh, however, my feelings on the pattern have changed quite a bit. I was feeling very demoralized with like the amount of ease that it gave here. Like I thought that there was way too much fabric and the fabric didn't sit nicely, like it was very stiff. I was already going, like I already had to go down two needle sizes on my 3.5 instead of my 4. Uh, and I still wasn't on gauge, I should have gone down even like one needle size smaller. But I didn't want to because it was already so stiff. Uh, so I had to recalculate all the um, sort of the gauge uh, and sizing up, sizing down, like modifying the rows, etc. But I talk about that in my previous video. 
So I made the size extra small and I also shared that on my Instagram but I knitted it to the length that was required in the pattern and I tried it on before adding the ribbing and I thought that it was already hitting me at a point that I liked on my hips, like a cropped sweater. So I ripped back a few inches, like maybe three inches of a body in stockinette then I put it back on the needles and then I was a bit like ugh, that was a waste of a day of knitting. So I put it aside, worked on some other projects and then after that I picked it back up, finished the ribbing and then I felt like it was too cropped and I was like oh I shouldn't even have ripped it out. Um, and I laid it out and the rowing out was really really bad, like you could totally see the rows of purling that I had done. And I thought maybe it'll block out, but who knows. And yeah, it was just, I was really not feeling great about this project and I was just kind of happy to have it off the needles. In my mind, I had already given up on it and I thought, well, whatever, not every project can be a win. And then next time, like I'll just cast on a new project and feel excited about that. And I'm just like giving up on this one, even though I finished it. And then I blocked it and everything changed. Like the rowing out is still visible, but I, I really don't mind that too much. Like it's not a, deal breaker. Uh, the fabric however softened up and relaxed and drapes and there seems to be like less stiffness on the upper body and so it doesn't um, look as yeah stiff and stern. It just it feels more, more loose like an actual sweatshirt and I've been wearing it pretty much every day since finishing it and I know it's so cliche to say that but like it's the truth. If you watch any UK podcasters, you will know that we're not having a really great summer. So it actually is sweater weather, even if it's August now. And so I have been wearing this jumper. The sleeves, that's also something I wasn't happy with. They were quite short before blocking. As you can see, they're still quite short. So I would say that they're pretty much like bracelet, bracelet length, which I don't think I have any sweater where I did that on purpose or have that. Uh, and it's not something that I wanted, like I've never kind of gone and, and said I'm gonna knit bracelet length sleeves But I'm kind of happy to have that happen by accident because now I can wear that and see if I even like bracelet length I know some people say that it's helpful because if you're the kind of person that you always pull up your sleeves because they bother you That could be helpful. Some people hate it because they're gonna feel like a draft in their wrists or the fact that like they can feel the fabric hitting at a weird point on the arm, on the forearm. So I don't know, I don't know what which camp I'm in. I do notice it, like I'm kind of pulling on it quite a lot. But I don't think that this would put me off bracelet length. I think it adds to the style and like the, the, the general vibe of this sweater, like the bracelet length. I quite like it. But this wouldn't have happened if the designer had put schematics. I complained about that in a previous podcast and I stand by it. I even went back to check and there's not even a schematic for the length, like body length whatsoever. The only measurement you get with this pattern is the body circumference, which I think is just not great for a design. I really think patterns should include more than just one measurement. It's crucial, especially if uh, you want to know what you're getting into in terms of like arm circumference, like bicep, wrist, etc. Uh, so yeah, I hope that the designer, maybe I'll contact her for f like just giving feedback. I think I'll do that and I'll let you know if she replies. But I think, yeah, uh, it was a bit disappointing because all of the patterns I've been working from before do have more than just one measurement. But I really, really have been enjoying wearing this because the yarn is amazing. It's so plush, feels like fleece and people have contacted me to say that this yarn even softens up more with wear, like everywhere it'll become even softer. And I'm really glad because I already have a sweater quantity for me of this yarn for a Harlow sweater. And I also have a sweater quantity for my boyfriend. I want to make him the Hans Holm sweater by Petite Net in this like nice uh, navy tweed color from this brand. And I'm so excited because he has even like, he hugs me when I'm wearing this and he says, oh, that feels so nice. It's like, Little does he know. Well, actually, no, he does know. But maybe he forgot because we bought that like six months ago. Um, so yeah, uh, he will have a sweater with this yarn uh, at some point. I don't know if I'll make it as a surprise or have him help with measurements. But I will not do this pattern again, even though I like it. I will try other saddle shoulder patterns. I'll be uh, putting photos and everything on the screen as I'm speaking anyway, um, like I do with my finished objects. But as you can see, like the, the, the nice thing about this is like the nice saddle shoulder 
detail and I really really like this fit on me I think that it suits me and my aesthetic and my vibe like it's very relaxed and like it feels like your boyfriend's sweater that you just borrowed and yeah I, I really like the details of this sweater the neckline is very nice I went down a lot like I think it was a 275 for the neck ribbing and the normal ribbing like it's twisted rib the details are great the look of the sweater is great but you need to know what you're getting into in terms of like how much fabric there's going to be at the underarm like it's so much so I think your choice of yarn might influence how this sweater behaves and your needle size and your gauge and everything so yeah I would say you could do this sweater I don't think I would like heartily recommend the pattern but if you do do it then be careful so yeah a roller coaster, but a redemption story at the end, I think. Uh, the total price of this sweater was £34.11. I'll put the price here, like, as I do, but I, this time I calculated it before editing the video, so I, I already know what the prices were. So, yeah, 34 quid for a sweater, woolly sweater. It's wool and spun yarn. I think it's really, really nice and affordable. I did end up with basically one and a half extra skein, so I bought more than what the pattern recommended. Uh, so yeah, I guess that's a bit annoying. I don't really know what to do with that because I could do a hat, but like I said, I don't even like this color. So I think I'll just donate the yarn at some point because I don't want to make an accessory with this color if I already don't like it that much on me. But you could definitely make a hat with one extra skein of Loch Lomond. So if you don't want to play yarn chicken and you want to buy an extra skein just to be safe, then uh, here's an idea of what you can do. As you can tell, I've really been into stash busting and using my extra leftover skeins. But yeah, I think it's really, really affordable, like £34 for a big oversized jumper. I love it. So that's it for this sweater, and I'll, I'll be living in it until I make another saddle shoulder for sure. Okay, the next finished objects then are five accessories. So I'll pull them up and then I'll talk about them one by one. And yeah, take notes if you're wanting to either make Christmas gifts, I know, the C word, uh, or if you want to use up your, like, less than one skein scraps that could be helpful and also they match my sweaters because they're all leftovers from sweaters so here's the little pile of accessories so I'll talk about the penny gloves first so um, the penny gloves by Petite Net I'll be honest though I did not buy the pattern and also I did not work with the same yarn or gauge so the, pe the penny gloves from Petite Net are originally made in sport way and I decided to make them in fingering. And the way that I did that and figured out the pattern was that I basically saw yarn I wanted to use. It's Drops Flora in the colorway beige. And I had this in my April cardigan. I had one and something extra skein, so I knew that I had enough. I considered holding it double and make DK weight, but I really wanted like the very crisp, tiny stitches that fingering weight offers. I thought it would suit the pattern more than something that was more bulky and messier. I thought that the neat little stitches would be perfect, like sock stitches. So I used needles that I knew would go well with uh, Flora, and so I used my 25 millimeter needles, like my sock needles basically, and I made a tiny little gauge swatch to see what gauge this would give me. And I can't remember exactly what the numbers uh, were for that, um, but then I figured out my hand circumference, figured out that I wanted maybe like one centimeter negative ease, so I subtracted, subtracted one from that number. And then I had the number of the circumference I wanted, and I had my gauge. So you do a bit of math, and then you figure out then how many stitches you need to cast on. And that was basically it. And everything else is just like personal preference of how long to make them. And if you've ever made mittens, you know how to do a gusset. Basically, you just have to increase on either side of the thumb and once you have your thumb length you put the thumb stitches on hold cast on like a few stitches to continue the hand like you would an underarm basically a thumb gusset is an underarm like sideways uh, I mean like upside down so here's the penny gloves by the way like let me uh, show them before I talk too much about them they're so gorgeous we took some really amazing photos a couple days ago um, of the gloves, they're, they're so, so, so beautiful. I blocked them, they're like so smooth and flat and tiny. The uh, pearl edge, I obviously sort of uh, copied from the penny gloves, like that's also what they're known for, is that little pearl uh, bump edge on uh, the bottom, the top and the thumb, but that's like easy enough to figure out how to do. And I blocked them 
tried to make sure that it was very straight, but I know that th these are going to have a tendency to like curl up, but that's fine. So I won't try them on because I'm already quite warm, but I'll have put some, some photos of me wearing them. The thing is, they actually go so well with this jumper because they go down quite far on the wrist, and so that would be perfect to avoid the draft from that sweater. If I were to wear this out, like on an autumn day, I could just have those and I would be warm for sure. Uh, so what I was saying was basically I just decided myself when to stop this before starting to increase and I decided how long to make the finger portion. So I didn't need the pattern for that. So I was quite chuffed with myself to be perfectly honest, having figured out how to do this pattern without needing to buy a pattern. I think it's a testament to how far you come as a knitter is when you can actually start to see some projects and you say, well, actually I could make that. I don't need someone to tell me how to do it because I have enough like knowledge and like resources that I know how to how to hack the pattern. Um, obviously I wouldn't go and rewrite this pattern and sell it as my own because of like intellectual property and everything, but just for my own use, I'm happy that I didn't need to buy the pattern to make this pair. And I love them. I absolutely love them. They didn't use much yarn at all. They used 25 grams of Drops Flora, so half skein, and that's about 105 meters. So I looked at my stash on Ravelry. Uh, by the way, my previous video uh, on how to use Ravelry, I explained how you can go check like with your meterage of your yarn stash what patterns you can do with that sort of meterage. So all that to say that I looked at my stash, looked at the yarn that I had 105 meters approximately, and I basically could make like three more pairs of these penny gloves by using scraps. So I've got one in Kinross for ply in the gray. I have another Flora in gray. And I have Cardiff cashmere in like mint. So oh, yeah, I'm going to make. And then also I have some black Filiclana Alva that I could use double. And then it'd be like 100% alpaca like lace held double gloves in black. So yeah, I have five pairs of penny gloves that I'm going to make. And I could say that I'm going to make them as gifts, but I think I'm just going to keep them all for myself and just have like 10 different pairs of gloves because they're going to like, I'm going to match them to my outfits and my coats and my like uh, headwear and scarves. So yeah, super happy to have made this pattern for myself and I wrote it all down so I know the um, rows and the stitches that I want to do. If I'm playing a bit of yarn chicken, I'll just like remove a bit of length on the hand there. I really like this length. I know it's from what I've read the length that I've done here is shorter than what the pattern had recommended, um, but still quite long. And if I would change anything, maybe I'd add like well, two more stitches, because they are quite snug, but I prefer my gloves to be, you know, very windproof and dense, like a sock would, and I, that's how I prefer my accessories, I guess. And um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll just refine and finesse that little recipe that I've made but I'm really happy with it. Let me check my notes. Uh, I cast on pearl wise before doing the pearl row, which I thought was quite neat and I didn't know how to do that. So I just followed the video. I think I put the video on my Ravelry notes. If you've ever done casting on pearl wise, it's like it, you're doing the same thing as a long tail cast on, but you're doing a different motion. And I quite like that. So I'll keep that in mind. I bound off with a 275. So I went one needle size up for binding off because I didn't want my fingers to be restricted when I move them. Um, I also, the way that I did the thumb and picked up for the thumb afterwards, which is very finicky, to be honest. There's not a lot of stitches, it's tiny needles, and you don't want holes. The way that I did it was I, I put the stitches I had on hold back on my needles, magic loop, and then I picked up two extra stitches on either side, just like I would for an underarm, and then in the next row, I immediately decreased those four stitches. So I put the link as well, again, in my Ravelry. It's the exact same link that I always follow for my underarm stitches. Not on this, because it's not a raglan. But it really has served me well. And I think it, it worked so well on these penny gloves. There's no gap whatsoever. It's super neat. The yarn is a little bit fuzzy as well with the alpaca. Like, fuzzy without being mohairy. And yeah, I'm... I'm super happy. Next time I probably would make them two at a time just so it's faster. I think these only took like a couple days or three days. So that was also very impressive. Yeah, I think it was two days. And then lastly, the cost of these, because the way that I calculate my yarn cost, by the way, is I calculate it to the gram or to the meter. So 
if I use seven and a half balls, I'll say that I use seven and a half balls, not that I use eight balls. I don't round up or anything. So then I calculated what I had left over of the flora and the price of this, and these were 92 peas, 92 pence. Less than one pound for an alpaca wool pair of stunning gloves. That's just, like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, surely my math is wrong, but it's not. These really were that cheap. So if you ever buy some flora on sale, because I think I, I bought it on sale like last year, and you have leftover flora and you want to make those, it's insane. Like my labor, the hours I put in this cost more than the yarn. Okay, I think that's enough for the penny gloves. As you can see, I'm very excited about them and I, I definitely w want to make more pairs. I'll try not to burn out and force myself to make like, you know, one every week or every other week, but I'll, I'll try and use the stash that I just mentioned to, to, to make more pairs. Okay, so the next project is the Weekend Headband by Petite Knit. And once again, I did not buy the pattern for that. I just uh, made it up as I went because I looked at the project and I knew how it was done. And also uh, I had been eyeing this pattern forever because I had just the yarn in stash. So here's my weekend headband. I'm so, so, so happy with this color. It's like the perfect anthracite color. That's the name of the color. It's Pure Gains by Scentless Garn in the color anthracite. Um, 1088. Now that's left over from my Louvre sweater, which I made a year ago. And it is a bit rustic, it's quite rustic actually, to be honest, like medium I would say, or a bit more. And I know some people would absolutely cringe at the thought of putting that on their foreheads, but for me my forehead is less sensitive than, say, like my chest or my neck, so I absolutely don't mind having a very sturdy wool ear warmer, because I know that I'm not as sensitive. And like I said, I just sort of f figured out my gauge with this on the ribbing, figured out my head circumference and the negative ease that I wanted cast like and that way I found the number of cast on stitches and then the way that you make this headband is basically like you start off you start off like let's say here in the middle and you work your way up and then down and then back up and then you join with your cast on edge you know without saying more about this pattern because obviously if you want to do it and you don't know how then buy the pattern but the interesting thing with that is the technique of casting on. You use uh, Judy's magic cast on, and then to uh, join that together at the end, you have to use the Kitchener bind off, but you have to bind off in pattern and it's ribbing. And I had never done that before, and there's a video provided with Petite Net, so I followed that video. It was absolutely crucial. I wouldn't have been able to do it without. And look at my edge. That's my Kitchener edge. Obviously, you can see a line, but like, it's extremely stretchy, it doesn't flare, like this is the a rectangle. It doesn't flare, you can't see it from far away, like the inside and the outside, like I'm so so chuffed with that. The bind off, like the Kitchener bind off, took as much time, if not more, as the entire headband and it was so worth it. At some point I made a mistake and I thought it was the end of the world because there's so many steps you have to keep in mind for like the repeat, like the sort of sequence. And I didn't remember what I had just done or what I was about to do. And I was like, oh, what do I do? So I kind of just improvised and kept going and it turned out okay. I was worried that I would come out at the end and there would be like way many more stitches on like one needle than the other. Cause that's what a mistake would make you do. But then I finished off and I just had like the right number of needles on the right number of stitches on my needles. So it was perfect. As you can see, like the, the bind of, like the columns of knits follow the columns of knits on the other side, which is exactly what you want. So that's, that's amazing. I'm really, really happy. I would do it again. I have some Phil Glana Peruvian Highland wool and also like the charcoal colorway that I used for my Dartmoor and I want to make that and it'll be the exact same as that. I think maybe I'll, I want less I want less stitches on my next one, so I'll make it again. I'll make it in Phil Colonna Peruvian Helen wool, which is even softer than this, like much softer, and it's the same gauge, So and I'll do less stitches. So I'll, I'll, I'll do this again. You will see another one of these at some point in the winter. It'll just be nice to have multiples, and then again, it would be an excellent gift. And this cost £4.23, because I used one and something skines that I had left over from the Louvre. So it's not a one skine project. Although if you made it smaller, then maybe you could just have one skine. 
So it was 58 grams, 104 meters of DK weight. Okay, next project, speaking of headbands, I actually did mention previously that I wanted to make this, and this is using the leftover yarn from my socks that I think I showed in the last podcast, and it's yarn from Nervous Fiber. So here's the headband. It's really pretty. The yarn is fingering weight, sock yarn, and I held it double. And this is the kind of, like, color that it created. And the pattern is the School Run Headband by Penrose Nets or Laura Penrose. It's one of the very first patterns that she released, I think, last year. And I've made one of these before, also with leftovers. And I, I wore that all the time in winter, like, and, and that headband has seen life. Like, I, I shoved it in pockets, in bags, in coats. Like, so I think it would really be handy to have another one of these because I, I can see something awful happening to the first one if I keep uh, bringing it with me everywhere. And the first one was in beige. This one is kind of like multicolor. I think the next headband I want to do with that pattern, because there will be a next one, will be a dark one. Like, I think it'll be good with the contrast of my head. I took some photos of this one, so I'll put that on screen as well, like of me wearing it. And to be honest, I don't think that my head suits headbands that well because of the fact I don't really have like a fringe or anything. So I feel like I look like an egg when all my hair is pulled back, but we're really going for function over fashion and it's not about like how pretty I look it's about how warm my ears are my ears are so sensitive they get cold so easily when we did a little photo shoot of the Joan sweater a couple days ago in August with my boyfriend uh, I was only wearing the jumper and my ears got cold towards the end like that shouldn't happen anymore but anyway this headband is really nice because it's got like a nice little pico edge like you'll see and a nice little twist at the top. My only problem with this one, I don't know if you're going to be able to tell, I'm a, I'm a bit annoyed, and I don't know, I think it's my fault, I guess, is that it feels really stretched out at the knot. Like, I feel like the stitches are being quite, like, pulled together, and I worry about the durability of that. Like, I guess the, the gauge isn't that dense, it feels quite stretchy. But I was playing yarn chicken with this, and... I only have this left, so I think I did win Yarn Chicken, but maybe I would have been happier with having a couple more stitches on this so that it wouldn't have been as stretched out when I'm wearing it. But it'll be very handy to have. And then the cost of this one then is £8.64 because it was expensive hand-dyed yarn, although I did get this yarn on sale, so... Uh, and I'm really happy that I got a pair of socks and a nice double thick headband out of one kind of hand dyed yarn. And by the way, uh, I'm in the process of making a whole video on projects that you can make with one ball of special hand dyed yarn. So if you want to see that video, then make sure to subscribe to the channel to not miss it when it comes. I'm like so excited to share with you all the projects I've been collecting and stashing away in preparation for this video. So yeah, stay tuned for that. I think next time for this project, maybe what I'll try and do is a, is a provisional cast on and then Kitchener at the end, because the way that you joined is with mattress stitch, and that one definitely leaves like more of a visible ridge uh, and bulk, and you can feel it. It's fine, but when it's on my head, I guess I do feel a little bit of that ridge. And it wasn't the neatest, and it also wasn't the funnest. I much prefer Kitchener Stitch. So I think, now that I've done this pattern twice, if I were to do it a third time, I'd feel more comfortable doing those kind of modifications. The next project is something that I've never done before, and so it's a pattern designer that I've loved for ages, and I didn't buy anything from her yet, but I had plans. And then she had a pattern sale a few days ago, or yeah, a few days ago. Had a pattern sale for, uh, I think her anniversary or her birthday, and so I bought this pattern because normally I would have been a bit annoyed at having to pay full price for a pattern for a hair bow, but it was on sale so I thought that's fine, just pay for the pattern and then follow the instructions and have fun. Don't try and figure out how it's made. And so here it is, it's the Augustine's 22. Oh, that is so cute. The color is stunning. It's like the creamiest, most beautiful, elegant, like, oh. It, it's so nice. At first I was worried that, that making it in this color would not go well with my hair, but my hair is obviously much darker, much darker than this, like, bleached platinum white 
thing. But yeah, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, but I just, this is so good. So I'm going to the restaurant actually um, for lunch today. So maybe I will put this in my hair. T yeah, oh yeah, I'm totally gonna be wearing this today. But obviously I'm gonna show you now. Uh, normally what you do is you put an elastic at the back, but I've put a bobby pin and I'll just use it as a pin. I think it just gives me more control than an elastic. So I really won't go into too much detail about the construction of this because I think that's what you're paying for in the pattern. And um, yeah, there's not that much to it. You just make this big sort of like rectangle, like a long thin ribbon rectangle, and then you tie it together in this shape. So that's how you get the bow. And the uh, yarn I used was some leftover Philcolan Atelia in white. Snow White, I think. This is what I have left. I used 9 grams of mohair. And then the uh, fingering weight I used is this color from Knit Picks. It's Knit Picks palette and it's the color Oyster Heather that I used for some mittens like a year and a half ago. So really nice to use those like scraps. This was from the balloon sweater I had made. I was holding that with marzipan but I completely ran out of marzipan like at the end of the balloon sweater. So this is pretty close to marzipan to be honest. So this would go really well with my balloon sweater. So I used 25 grams of the fingering. So again, a half skein project of fingering and like a tiny little bit of mohair, less than a half ball of mohair. I highly recommend the pattern. It was so fun. Like it's so fast and quick, like rewarding. Um, it wasn't what I had expected, like, it was done in a different way than I had thought so it was really nice to just follow the instructions line by line and see where the pattern was going to take me um, I wish I had used bigger needles though, I was using them on like hat circumference needles and that was way too small, I had way too many stitches so I wish I had done it on bigger needles because then that, that would have been a, a more enjoyable knitting experience but like I said it was really fast so I didn't, like, I didn't really bother switching needles uh, I used the size needle recommended, a four millimeter, and it gives a really nice fabric. Like it's not, it's it's really nice and it's still it's still flowy because of the mohair. I don't think I would want to do this in a DK, and if I did, maybe at size like up needle so that it was more flowy. Um, what else to say? It has you do a three needle bind off purl wise, which I hadn't done before either. So then I looked that up and used the YouTube video that I put on my Ravelry. Um, used a long tail cast on. The instructions were a tiny bit unclear at some point. The way that it was written, it was like a pattern repeat. And I think that it could have benefited from like being written in a different way. I think Augustine is a Danish designer, so maybe it's something to do with the translation. But if you know how to bind off something, then you'd understand what she was trying to get you to do. So I thought that was fine. And once you make one, I think it's easier to understand how it works and so you can modify other ones to be different. So I like I like this one. I think it's, it's huge, but in a good way, like princess huge. And if I wanted to make a smaller one, I would know how to do that. Even though the pattern only comes in one size, I think I could figure out myself the numbers I would want and I just experiment to make a few smaller ones maybe like two little ones for Christmas that'd be cute so I've got some yarn stash already that I plan to make a few more of these unless I find another sort of hat hair bow accessory that I want to try out a different pattern but this pattern is a winner in my book and the total cost of this project then was 367 because of the cost of the mohair basically is what was driving up the price because Knit Picks palette is not expensive so yeah just a nice little couple day project that was really fun and I really recommend a different type of construction it was just fun to, to do something different for once okay and then the last finished object is a hat I'm not feeling a huge excitement for this one it was just really functional so the long story is that I want to make a beanie for my grandma, a white beanie she kind of requested. She was feeling very shy, like she didn't want to ask me to knit anything for her, but I was saying, I want to do something for you, what would you like if I were to do something? And so we kind of landed on a hat and she said a white one. And I have some white yarn in stash, I have like some Nepal, Drops Nepal, Malabrigo Rios and also Cascade 220 in natural and they're not all the same way but like they're all the same shade pretty much like that is all off-white basically none of them are like the pure white colorway 
and I think I just have enough, like just enough, to make a hat out of that. So I wanted to try out some hat patterns using other yarns to see the matrix I would end up using and any modifications I could do to like squeeze out that yarn. And I ended up making this hat with some Malabrigo Rios. Uh, so this is Jason Cashmere hat and it's a free pattern. And it's got some really nice cables. The yarn, obviously I don't know if it's the best for this pattern because it is variegated, it's Malabrigo. Uh, if you don't know, it, they really have that like hand-eyed look to them. I hope the light is not weird, I feel like I'm very bright. But um, whatever, it was what I had on stash. And this would be a very nice little uh, gift for uh, a man in my life, I think. And yeah, I think the result is that that is enough. Like, I have enough white yarn to make a second version of this in white for my grandma. It was quite boring to do, I'm going to be honest. The pattern is originally for, I think, Aaron, and Malabrigo is worsted. So I went down the needle size. I did the brim on 375, so it was tighter, and then the body on 4. I probably could have done less stitches because it stretches out a lot because it's super wash. And maybe wish I had made the brim a little bigger because it, it keeps on like falling and unfolding. Maybe if I had done a, a pearl row to like indent it and have it fold more nicely. So I'll, I'll keep those in mind when I'm making the white one later. And I think that's it. I really don't have anything else to say. It's a free pattern, I don't know if I've said. So if you want to stash bust, do cables, like learn about hat construction, go for it. I made a couple of modifications based on other Ravelry comments. I put those in my description again on Ravelry, but basically I, I added a couple more rows when you're doing the crown decreases to make the transition a bit smoother. And then at the end, at some point, they have you do all knit two together, but instead I did all slip slip knits. I don't know. Other people said to do it and I did it because I'm a sheep. <laughs> so that's it for that. And it was £7.65 because it used almost one entire ball of Malabrigo Rios. Because I remember when I made my winter sole sweater ages ago, um, I had only bought one ball of this and then I ran out like just at the end of the sleeve. So I had to buy one more ball of this color, which is Playa, by the way. I had to buy one more ball of that, just cracked into it to make the sleeve of the winter sole. Then I had almost one entire skein left and I was a bit annoyed at having like run out of yarn so close to the end. So I finally used that ball of Malabrigo Rios, which was kind of like my first purchase of like fancy yarn. I remember when I bought the Rios, I was like, oh my God, that's so expensive for one ball of yarn. Little did I know that that was not nearly like as expensive as other things that were gonna come in my life. Okay, so I don't know how long I've been speaking for, but I feel good about what I said. I think that was all I wanted to say. I'm really, really happy with all of my um, fun accessories. And yeah, I think like this is, I've done all of that in like two weeks, right? Because basically all of them were only taking two days and I've made five. So yeah, 10 days, like how amazing. And if I had set myself to do that, like if I had told myself, do those five projects in two weeks, I would have been stressed out of my mind, but it just happened. So definitely gonna keep making accessories and stash bust all throughout the autumn uh, until December comes. And that way I'll just have like a big pile of gift knits and I can just like pull from it. And I have gifts for every occasion. And, but like I said, half of these I'm gonna keep for myself and, and make tons of versions. Like I want to have a bow like that in all different colors for sure. Okay. Works in progress. The first thing I'll talk about is my Qtar top, and I've already talked about that in my previous episode. And I want to preface this by saying that um, Amy from Ninet is making one as well, and we're like at the exact same point. We started at the same time, and we're both making it in the same color, and that was not calculated whatsoever. And if you want to hear her experience, she also very eloquently talks about the problems that she's encountered and like what she did to fix them. And so we have a tiny bit of a different approach to the project. So I'll show you what I've got. I've just joined my ooh, second ball of um, Knitting for Olive Pure Silk in the color Haze is what I'm doing for this. And she is making hers in Tin Linnet from Sennes Garn. I think, I want to say Knitting for Olive is thinner than Tin Linnet, but actually I don't know. I think they're both light fingering, to be honest. And the pattern originally calls for either a sport yarn or like heavy fingering. 
So I went down a few needle sizes. I'm on 275 needles and it's my bamboo needles that my boyfriend gifted me for my birthday. And that is also the second redemption arc of this entire episode. Last episode I talked about how the bamboo needles were quite like the yarn was snagging on it when it was traveling, when I was making the lace panel of the guitar top and it was not enjoyable. And I was worried, was it, was it the bamboo? Was it the cables? Was it the, a defect of my set? And lots of you were super helpful in the comments saying that you also had that experience, which is a shame obviously, but it wasn't just me. And you recommended that I switch the swivel clear cables that came with the set with my red lace cables. And on the one hand, I didn't want to do that because I was happy getting another set so that I'd have more cables because my life is a constant battle of running out of cables and needles and not being able to cast on all the whips because I only have so many cables. And I was really looking forward to having more cables. But I'm actually happy to say and report that once I join in the round and I'm doing stockinette in the round, it's completely fine. Like it doesn't snag at all. So I think it may have had something to do with the lace and all the knit two togethers and yarn overs and weird stitches like that. I think that those were tighter and then they were or like they were mounted in a weird way that it was snagging on that join of the cable and the needle tips. But when you're doing stockinette in the round it's so smooth and I've been able to just cruise on the body of this and yeah, really, really happy with the bamboo. Like, I'm super enjoying the combination of pure silk and the bamboo. It's just, it feels so different than knitting with wool. And it, I guess it's good for my hands to, to switch between, like, fibers and materials. So, since I last saw you, I made the back panel, I joined in the round, and I made the straps and the I-cord edgings. So quite a lot to talk about. The modification that I did was that normally you're uh, making straps like at the top, at the front and at the back and you're joining them on the shoulder, but I didn't want that, I just made my straps very long from the top and I'm going to join them at the back, that way the join is at the back and not on top of the shoulder. And I've not joined them yet, I've just very provisionally joined them with like pins because what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a final block when it's over to see how much my eye cords stretch out then I'll do adjustments if needed so I'll try and show you this there are so many ends it's going to be a nightmare to weave in that's my top so far so um, it's looking quite small because it's on a small needle right now but yeah so that's the, the lace and I did lace at the back. Some people have said the modification that they did was that they just did a stockinette panel at the back. And I think that's first, first of all a great idea to save time and hassle. And then just very creative and really nice. And also it will be easy to figure out where is the front and where is the back. So check those projects out if you want. And yeah, the I'm doing here, uh, it's an A-line shaping. So every time I do an increase, I am adding a bobby pin, uh, not a bobby pin, um, light bulb marker. So I'll put this down because I just want to talk about it. I have not encountered the same problem as Amy at the start. She says that hers was very loose. She used the provisional cast on recommended by Sari in the pattern, which has you provisionally cast on already on like the scrap piece of yarn. And I used the, the crochet provisional cast on. And I also did all of that on small needles, like 2.5. So I, I cast on on my provisional cast on on the 2.5. And I found that that was perfect. Then I picked it up later and I did my eye cord also on the 2.5 because I really wanted everything to be nice and tight. However, when I did it, my eye cord like bind off on the 2.5, it was kind of bunching and it was too tight. So I made that the back piece. And then on the front piece, I used my 275, so the needles that I use for the body, I use that for the eye cord bind off, and it lays off like really nice and flat. So I didn't have any problems with the gaping, which is good. However, when I made my first panel and I made the provisional cast on, I used some scraps of hand dyed yarn and then I blocked it. And when I unzipped then that provisional cast on and picked it back up, the hand dyed had bled on my pure silk, and I'll put a photo, I was like screaming, I was not expecting that. It makes sense in retrospect that hand dyed can, can, can bleed in the first wash, 
and I thought that was so stupid of me. I have a ton of other scraps. Why did I pick that hand-dyed scrap? So word of warning to you, don't make the same mistake that I did. But it's on the inside of the work and it's gonna be on the back. So I'm not too sad about it. And it didn't happen for the front because I realized that before making the front. So that's good. Uh, the other very important thing that I did was that I joined the panels immediately after finishing the lace. Sari originally has you knit and stock in it for a certain like length of like the panel before you join in the round, but I had read tons of notes of people on Ravelry saying that that led to a very low underarm that then showed the bra and was like just uncomfortably low. So I didn't want that at all. So I cast, I, I joined in the round immediately after the lace, but I was worried that this was gonna make my underarm too high. When I was putting it on my body, I was like, there's no way I'm gonna join here. Like it was, it was really too high. So I made the straps really long just to give me that room. And what I'm gonna do is, like I said, when I'm done blocking and everything, I can unzip my eye cord to make the straps exactly how I want them. And I think the thing that I struggled so much this summer to wrap my head around, and bear with me because I, I struggled to express this. When you're making those kind of constructions of tops, there's two places where you can modify length. There's the length of the panels before you join in the round, and then the length of the straps. And in my mind, it took me so long for it to click. I didn't know, like, could you just use those interchangeably? Like, what does it matter where the underarm is? What does it matter where the back is? Like, if you wanted a top that was 50 centimeters, like from the back, or from the straps, rather, could you just make the straps longer? Could you make the underarm shorter? I just couldn't wrap my head around it. But then I watched N uh, Amy's video the other day and I realized the, the crucial part is that where you join at the underarm will define where the, the, the top sits at your underarm. But the length of the straps, that will define where the neckline falls of your pattern. And she had to overcompensate. She had to make her straps tiny to avoid the underarm being too loose, which means that her top is gonna sit very, very high on the neck, whereas my one, because it has longer straps, it's gonna fall lower and my neckline will be lower. So we'll have a very different garment. Even though we both won't have too, too bad an underarm, the neckline of ours will be different. And so I think I really wanna keep that in mind is not only do I want to control where my underarm is, but I also want to have control over when, where my neckline is. And remember that if I modify the straps, that is what it's going to change. So I hope that makes sense. Like I had the same problem with my camisole number four, where I didn't understand like the strap length and didn't understand what the fuss was about. But anyway, I don't think I've, exp I've expressed that well, but it's fine. This top is very fiddly, I will say that. Like, um, it's nothing to the pattern. I'm expressing again the same thing that Amy did in her video, where um, there's just so much I-cord bind-offs and so much I-cord edging and grafting to do. So there's a million ends to weave in. You need a tons of needles. You need a ton of stitch markers to put your stitches on hold. And I'm kind of enjoying it in the sense that it's challenging as the lace was but I just really miss my top-down raglan sweaters where you just don't have all that hassle and fuss to deal with. And there's just more room for errors and gaping. I had also read that the underarm cast-on could be loose in some people, so I made sure to do that on smaller needles. So the one thing that I'd recommend for people, definitely, is if you're about to do a project, go on Ravelry, search for other people's notes. I also demonstrate that in my previous video, but you can search by helpful notes and see what other people have found helpful in others' notes. Then you can see, for example, here, a lot of people had complained about the eye cord edging being loose and the underarm being too low. So yeah, basically what I did after I joined in the round was doing all the eye cords and, and straps and everything. So I'd get all of that behind me while I was motivated and now I'm just doing the body. I chose to do the A-line shaping just because I want to see if I like it and then um, that I'll do the folded hem. I don't know if I'll have enough yarn, like, I don't think I'm playing yarn chicken, but I know some people who use the same yarn as me were, were a bit worried about their amounts, so... 
I think it'll be fine. But I'm, I'm really enjoying this project now that all of the fiddly bits are behind me and I'm looking forward to finishing it. But I'm also kind of look, I just enjoy that stockinet in the round in pure silk. I really, really enjoy it. So I'm not too mad. Uh, but I do want to wear it before um, summer is over. Okay, the next project is a pattern by Jessie Maid and it's the Cozy Classic Light. So I'm sure that I talked about that before. I had bought some yarn from Zakami. It was the color Lick Eskimos and it was on alpaca silk cashmere. So here it is in a cake. And um, yeah, I originally wanted to bring this with me to my holiday in Belgium because I thought a fingering weight sweater, there would be nothing better than just mindless stocking it. And I had cast it on, done the short rows, but then I quickly realized that what I wanted to do was alternate skines. I bought two skines, or 400 meters each, so I've got 800 meters. And I thought I would alternate, which I had never done before, just to give me the best chance of having a good results. And then also it's a compound raglan, which isn't just plain stockinette. And, it, you, and then I was also going to do some sizing modifications, so I just quickly realized that that maybe wasn't going to be the project I should bring to Belgium and god I am glad I didn't because I just brought some socks and that was perfect. So came back from Belgium, cast it on this project, like well I had cast it on and on the short rows. So I kept going on this project and I finished all the raglan increases and split for sleeves. So I'll show you what I've got. Um, I really have no idea how this shows yet on the camera, so I don't know if this is accurate, but it's... Oh, I wish you could feel this yarn through the screen. It is heavenly. It's so nice and soft. It's very, like, squishy. And it's uh, got a bit of a halo as well because of the alpaca. It's, it's gorgeous. I'm so happy with my choice of having purchased that uh, base for the hand dyed. So, quite a lot of things to say about this, but they're not going to be that long to talk about, so I'll just fire through them. Um, I'll put this down <laughs> after showing it. But as you can see, like the color is like, nice and speckled. Like It's not nothing too in your face, I don't think. <clears throat> so, I am doing this on 3.25mm instead of 35 because the Jessie Maid's projects are always on huge needles, and I'm already a loose knitter, so there's no way that I can follow Jessie Maid's gauge. So I size down needles. I'm usually a size extra small or small, but um, in this case, because of my gauge being slightly different, I probably should have done small or medium. However, because I'm running with a limited amount of yarn, I thought that doing the size small would be wiser, and maybe I could cast on a couple extra stitches here and there, just to give me the best chance of having enough ease, but also not running out of yarn. I also had read everywhere and heard from everyone that the neckline is was too wide and too stretched out. The original pattern has you cast on, um, like tubular cast on, and do the rib and continue, but yeah, I didn't want that. So I cast on normally at the place where you're supposed to like have the neck, just before the short rows, and I cast on a, like four stitches less than extra small, did one round, and then I added those four stitches back to give me the extra small neckline. And I'm gonna pick up later and do like the neck. And then what I did was that I followed the instructions for size extra small for the short rows, like following those numbers. Then I did the raglan instructions for the size small. And then I added also one, so, so then that means that I did one more uh, raglan increase than the size extra small called for. And then I also added more length to my yoke before splitting for sleeves because my row gauge was different. So basically what, when I'm doing this project, I am like keeping an eye on the pattern, keeping like my calculator handy, my measuring tape like on site, and I'm pulling from two different cakes of yarn. So it's quite an engaging knit and not a mindless one. I have to keep an eye on a lot of different things. There were two different raglan sections uh, because it's a compound raglan. So in the end, I also added one extra or two extra underarm stitches at each side than what the pattern called for, just to give me again like a couple centimeters more of ease is what I wanted. So I think that's good. I tried it on and I really liked it. And uh, now we're just cruising along to the body. I've done like an inch since the underarm split and there's body decrease options. And again, just to save on yarn, I've decided to do the second option, which is to slightly taper it towards the waist. 
There's a crop length and a normal length. The crop length is an insanely cropped length. I don't know if I'd ever do that. The normal length is also a bit, li a little bit too cropped for me. So I'm planning to add one inch more than that before adding my ribbing, but I'll see how I get on with my yarn like amount. At this point, like I said, my two yarns are already joined to the body because I'm using it for um, helical knitting is what I'm doing to alternate skines. I don't know at which point I'm gonna take apart like the skines and do the sleeves or do the neck. I don't know if I, because I really want to do the neckline as soon as possible because like it'll just give me that sense of it's almost finished <laughs> or like it'll look more like a sweater. And I also don't know if I want to do a double folded neckline or not. I want to do a double folded. I don't know if I have enough yarn to do that. Because yeah, I don't know. I don't know when I should split my yarn and work on a different part instead of just the body. I think soon. I think I'm going to do the neck very soon. Then maybe do a sleeve and see how many like grams that was. Don't know. As you can see, I'm quite confused with this project, but it's really enjoyable to work on. The yarn is quite slippy, slippery on my needles, but yeah. Then the helical knitting that I was talking about, it's my first time doing that. At first, I couldn't wrap my head around it, but I got it. I understand it. My only criticism with that is that no one really explains what you're meant to do when you when your three slit stitches go over the raglan increases but the way that I did mine I only had to cross over a raglan increase twice so I started my yarn at the back that's where the beginning of round is and I had to go over one sleeve raglan and then over one sleeve raglan and then by the time that was finished uh, I was already on the body so even though it's a tricky aspect of helical knitting, is like that raglan increase thing, it only happened twice. So even if I did it badly, even though I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do it because no one is explaining what the, what the way to do it is, then it's only happening in two occasions, so it's fine. I hope that makes sense. It's getting to the end of the video and I can tell I'm getting a bit frazzled, so bear with me. I hope you're still here. There's still a few things to talk about. But yeah, really enjoying uh, knitting with my like hand-dyed, precious skines and not just uh, letting them linger on in the background while I never look at them. Well, I look at them, but I, I want to use them. And I'm just excited for it. it my, it's my first time doing lifted increases for a raglan and I really like it. I considered for a bit, like, should I just do make one left, make one right? But I wanted to, to try something new and it gives a really clean looking line of like slip stitches almost. It's very nice and clean. The yarn is looking a, a little bit like rumpled and... and, and um, yeah, it's it's not looking the best, the stockinette, but I think it'll block out and even out. I think it's just a, a case of tension because of it being so sleepy. Um, okay, I'll get my next project really quickly. The pattern is by Sari Nordlin. It's the, so the Minerva socks. I finished my first one and I cast on the toe of the second one. And uh, if you remember from my previous episode, oh, the difference is so huge. Like I've, I was just touching the, the applique silk cashmere and I'm touching this nylon wool and it's so different. That's insane. Anyway, uh, I was talking about this project before that I, I, I didn't like it as much as like the first summer sock Cal that Sari Nordlin is hosting. If you don't know, she has a new pattern like every month for four months. The fourth pattern takes the yarn of the first three one and the goal is to finish all pairs by the end of the summer and uh, she releases one on the first of the month. And I didn't like the second iteration of the Cal but I just didn't want to give up on the Cal so I, I continued and it's fine. Like it, it, it's just a knit that I had to do, so it wasn't as enjoyable, and that's why I haven't done the second one, because I wanted to work on things I enjoyed. Um, and then I just wanted to say that for the um, their toe-up, and I, I, did it, I did four repeats, they're quite short, I guess, at the ankle. The heel is really fun to do, like it's like mimicking a, a gusset that you do cuff down, but there's no stitches to pick up, so I guess if you're worried about that, don't, don't. <laughs> And then for the cast off, I did Jenny's surprisingly stretchy bind off, which was my first time doing that. And I'm so pleased with how straight, straight cut it is. I was worried it was gonna be flaring out, which I don't like with toe up socks, but this is giving me a really nice, neat finish. So I have cast on the second sock, I've done the toe, but I've not done any of the charts. And my plan is to just do the socks I want to do first, which is the August socks, 
and then I'll have finished those really soon because they go really fast. And so when I'm done with the August socks, I'll pick up quickly this one and finish it. Because I do want to finish the cal and do all the pairs. So yeah, that's it for that. And that was a West Yorkshire Spinner Signature 4 Ply in Candy Floss. The next project then is the August Socks by Sari Nordland. Today's the 4th of August. She released them on the 2nd of August. No, she released them on the 1st of August. I cast them on the 2nd of August and I've already done a lot. <laughs> so this is what I've got of the next pair. So I've done the cuff, the leg, the heel, and I'm doing the foot. And I'm using uh, Regia Premium 4 Ply uh, Yak Merino, and it's amazing. It's so plush, so squishy, so, like, it feels like fleece, like this as well. It's even softer. And I'm so happy I saved that yarn to make this pair. It feels much more suited to it, because it's just plain stockinette for most of it. The cuff is double folded, and then there's going to be a ruffle. They're called the Summer Girl Socks. Oh, it's, it's so good. Like, I, I just couldn't stop. The first part of the pattern was so fun because, like, no section was too long. You kept on having to do a next step, so it was very potato chippy. The leg was really short. Then you do the heel, which again, very, like, small. I am doing this on 2mm needles, which is my preferred needle size for socks. And I'm doing the size small, which I was a bit worried, like, oh, is that going to be, is that going to be too tight and too small for me? But no, I've tried these on and I love it. They hug my feet so well and they're so comfortable. They're so warm. My only issue with this pattern, which I'll try and remedy in the next one, is that the folded cuff uh, it has ribbing on the inside. You can see. And I don't know, I followed the pattern as recommended, but you can see the ribbing. There's a pearl row here as well. The pearl row ideally would be uh, at the top of this, but my pearl row is on the side and the ribbing is showing. So what I would do in my next pair is I would make the ribbing one less round or make the stockinette like two more rounds just to make sure that it covers it. So yeah, that's a little bit annoying, but that's fine. I, I love these a lot and I'm looking forward to making the ruffle, but I may regret my words because I've never done a ruffle before. I know that they involve a lot of stitches, but I've been really, really enjoying these socks and, and this yarn. I think they go so well together. So yeah, even though the Minerva aren't a win, I think that uh, these are going to be. And I'm really happy to be doing this cal. It's like, nice to challenge yourself and have a goal and something to work towards and to look forward to. I already can't wait, even though it's the 4th today, I can't wait to see Sari's teasing of, like, the 1st of September socks, but one thing at a time. The only modification that I did was that I did a crochet provisional cast on and not the other one that she recommends, uh, because I was worried about what Ninet, Amy, had said about uh, the stitches being very loose. So, yeah, just gonna use my trusty crochet provisional provisional cast on from now on for everything, I think, but who knows. Okay, uh, how are we doing on time? That's fine, uh, it's over an hour, this is gonna be a long episode, but there were a lot of finished objects. So the next thing then, okay, it's for my dad, so dad, if you're watching, and I think you are, stop watching now because this is all about your hat and you said you wanted it to be a surprise, so yeah, giving you two seconds to stop watching. Okay, so the next pattern is the Oslo hat by Petite Knit. And I know that I've said in this video that I've hacked two of her patterns. I'm gonna reassure you, I've not hacked this one. I bought it and I'm using the yarn Filklana Arweta in charcoal, which is a 956, I think. Yeah. And it's a beautiful, very dark gray entrusset. It's basically the color that I want to make my weekend, weekend headband in but in the Peruvian Helen wool, it's the same shade. And my dad had requested that I make him a hat because he saw my muscle bra hand one and he really liked that style of just like stocking it, folded over. And I thought I didn't want to make a second muscle bra, I thought I'd make an Oslo hat just to try like different things. And he requested one in like a dark, dark color, like neutral. And he requested a special customization. He w would want um, <clears throat> 
a little embroidered Belgian flag on it because obviously we're from Belgium. And uh, my dad plays tennis, he goes to tournaments and championships and there's a world tournament of tennis in, in August, end of August, and ideally he'd get the hat before then and he could wear his Belgian hat made by me to his tennis tournament and that'd be really, that'd be really cute. And of course, you know, as a knitter, if someone specifically requests an item of knitting, like, there's nothing better, is there? Like, it's nice to gift things to people because you want to, but like, if they're asking for one, uh, that, that's just so, so, so amazing. So I'll show you the, the colors I've got for the Belgian flag. Uh, two of them are Malabrigo sock weight, and then this yellow one here is Cascade 220 Heritage. Uh, not 220, just Cascade Heritage. So, oh, I don't know if the camera's gonna flip it, but yeah, Belgian flag. So I'll have this to embroider the hat with that. So I'll show you the hat I cast it on not so long ago, because I'm kind of, I guess, on a deadline. I'm holding the yarn double, so working from the two balls of yarn, and here's what I've got so far. So I basically have the brim. It's a double folded, it's a triple folded brim, so you knit this big thing of stockinette, then you fold it onto itself, and then you knit the body of the hat. The tricky thing that I probably won't go into right now is if I want to embroider a um, little flag and I want the ends to be hidden, I have to very carefully decide where to place that embroidery. And because it's a flag, same as it would be like for writing, it actually does matter the orientation of it because if you're flipping the brim a couple of times, like the orientation of the writing or the flag could change. So I'm really, like, I haven't seen many people do this modification on the hat, even though it'd be really easy. I've seen people sew on a patch afterwards on the brim. I don't think I've seen anyone do duplicate stitch, which is what I'm going to do for this. So I'll make a little clip of me sewing, like, doing the embroidery and showing you the fold and everything, because I think it'll be good for other people if they want to do that modification, because it took me a while to get used to to that. Actually, I'll show you on something. Uh, it's toilet paper <laughs> and it's the French flag, so don't ask. But basically, what I wanted is to visualize what is going to happen like with the hat. So what I would want, ideally, is like this is what is going to happen is I've got like my brim, which is folded, and then the wrong side like is here. Because when you fold your brim, you're going to have the reverse side showing. So yeah, and then the flag here, trust me, is the right orientation. So then what I did is, this is what I want, and I'm working backwards, and I'm like, so then if I unfold it and see my knitting, then the flag obviously has changed orientation, and also the location of it, because here it was on this side, and here now it's on this side. So anyway, all that to say that I've done some very mathematic workings in my brain to figure out where to embroider this flag before I sew down the brim and can't turn back. So I will do a little clip of that when it comes to it so you can visualize it better, but I just wanted to say that that's the plan. And yeah, I'm enjoying the pattern, I'm enjoying the yarn, I'm using 3.5 millimeter needles and like the fabric is so nice. The yarn is so soft, like it's Arweta, it's super wash merino with nylon, so that he could wash it possibly and um, it's not too dense but the stitches are very nice and tight and neat. The thing I was worried about was is this going to be too dark for the black embroidery to show of my Belgian flag but I think we'll be fine. I think the black will show on this so this is really good to know and I'm really looking forward to having that little customized hat. And then also it's good to have the pattern Oslo hat because I want to make one for myself as well. Um, yeah, I've just reached the exciting point of folding it together. So I'll just have to make the flag and then we're good to go. Oh, the other very important thing I wanted to mention about this pattern is again, I've looked on Ravelry and a lot of people have mentioned that what they would change is that they would make a provisional cast on to make things easier. And I just did a long tail cast on, but I agree, maybe it would have been easier to do a provisional one. And then also, the decreases of the hat are written wrong in the pattern. They're missing a couple of instructions. So some people have re rewritten the decreases, which I've also done and put on my Ravelry notes. Even though I'm sure I would have like figured it out, it's good to know that other people have done that work for you and like flagged it out. And I think it's a shame that there's 
typos and mistakes like that in, in patterns, especially Petite Net, and I wonder if that feedback has been given to her and whether she has plans to change it, because this is a very old pattern. And I'm pretty sure it's been updated already, because some people were talking about how you have to sew the brim together, but in this version of the pattern, you knit it together with the cast on edge. So I don't know if it's people using those terms interchangeably or if the pattern has changed since its inception. But yeah, just wanted to flag that in case you also had the Oslo hat on your queue. And the last thing I wanted to mention was for this hat, when there's quite a lot of stitches to cast on, and also very crucially, for this bow, there were a lot of stitches to cast on. My number one recommendation is to use the cast on method where you're, instead of having your long tail and your working yarn, you're pulling yarn from two different like ends of the ball so that there's no long tail. You're basically um, using both tails like as working yarn. I'm sorry, I'm doing an awful job at explaining. I'll put a link below. But there's a way where you can long tail cast on with both strands coming from the skein, and that way you don't have to estimate how long your long tail should be. And the only downside of that technique is that you then just have two more ends to weave in. But in my book, that's 100% worth it so that you don't have to estimate and be wrong about how much yarn you need for a long tail cast on. So. I think that's it. I can't believe this has been so long and I hope that this was enjoyable and I hope that uh, you liked those projects. I certainly did. I'm having a lot of fun with knitting recently. I'm doing a lot of projects that I'm enjoying. Um, I'm really happy about this being like a good story in the end and not like on the downer that we left it as last time and in my Instagram stories I was whining about that quite a lot. Um, but yeah, no, it's been good and I've been really enjoying knitting from stash and doing those like stash busting projects and the fact that I identified in my stash like even more that could be done so either other versions of the projects I've talked about today or even more stash busting projects I'll definitely be making a video later in the year of like a roundup of all the stash busting projects and these might feature because I stand by them um yeah I think just Filming wise, I'm planning to do um, a video on hand dyed yarn very soon and um, another podcast in two weeks, like usual. Thank you so much for all the love and support that you've been giving me on my videos and my Instagram stories and in messages. And I've met a few of you like in person over the past few months, which is just insane. I can't believe how many people I've met through this whole uh, knitting podcast and the satisfaction it brings to grow as a channel and grow as a knitter and organize things and it, it gives me you know something to to care about something to look forward to something to work on like I'm, I'm working on this channel it's my project it's my baby and it brings me joy to work on this as much as it does like working on my knitting I really really enjoy making those videos and I hope that that's also maybe why you enjoy them because I enjoy them and all that to say that uh, I don't plan to stop anytime soon it's going really well I'm very inspired the only thing I wish is that I had 50 pairs of hands so I could be filming and editing my videos and also knitting at the same time because time spent on these videos is time that I can't spend on knitting but um, yeah, that's just the nature of the beast and I've become better at knitting while I'm editing so that's good I feel like I've been needing to edit those videos less I'm more able to speak for long periods of time without having to think about what I want to say so that makes it much easier for editing Venetia in the future but yeah, uh, that was that was all the little chat for me. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope that you're enjoying your knitting at the moment and that you are doing well wherever you are. I'll see you all very soon for a future video and don't forget to like or subscribe if you want to see more of this content. Bye everyone.